Plays. The National Broadcasting Company presents Great Plays, a series of famous plays selected to show the development of drama from the sunrise performances in ancient Athens down to the contemporary theater. In the absence of Burns' mantle, Mr. Brooks Atkinson, the noted dramatic critic of the New York Times, will act as commentator at today's production of Patience. Mr. Atkinson. Although Gilbert and Sullivan's Patience is a classic, no one need switch off his radio on that account. Many classics have to be approached in a spirit of dutiful reverence. But all the Gilbert and Sullivan operas are vastly enjoyable. It is 50 years since the last major Gilbert and Sullivan operas were written, but these topsy-turvy stories with rapturous music are still so popular that they are being sung constantly all over the world today. They are the finest and gayest things of their kind in dramatic history. How did that happen? It happened by the miracle that brought together two Englishmen who complemented each other perfectly in this branch of theater. W.S. Gilbert was a consummate master of light verse with a satirical mind and an expert knowledge of stagecraft. Arthur Sullivan was the foremost musician in England at that time. Both were gentlemen of impeccable taste in artistic matters. Taking a form of stage entertainment that was hackneyed and silly, they created a thoroughly tidy species of light opera that burlesqued the foibles of Victorian society with enormous skill and vocal beauty. But nothing about these two men was quite so remarkable as the fact that they could not get on together peaceably. Gilbert was a testy and arrogant man with a cutting tongue and no sense of humor about himself. Sullivan was a howling swell who enjoyed good society as well as good music. And it was his great ambition to quit fooling and write serious music. He did write some of the best music of his time in England and is still remembered as composer of The Lost Chord and Onward Christian Soldiers. Even during the long years when they were brilliantly successful, Gilbert and Sullivan continually vexed each other. Their temperaments clashed. Ultimately, they fell out altogether over the cost of a new carpet in the Savoy Theatre. That was the end of the fabulous career of Gilbert and Sullivan. Although finally they patched up their quarrel and wrote two more operas together, the magic was gone, and the two greatest collaborators for the comic opera stage were no better than the hacks they had driven out of the business. Patience, or Bunthorn's Bride, which was first produced in 1881, comes out of the earlier half of their career together. It poked ironic fun at the aesthetic movement that was fashionable in London at the moment, particularly at Oscar Wilde, who was the most fantastic of the posers and celebrities, and also at Algernon Swinburne, the poet, and James McNeil Whistler, the painter and wit. It was Gilbert's satiric notion to represent all the lovesick maidens who would normally fall in love with handsome soldiers as being hopelessly infatuated with conceited poets. The heavy dragoons cannot understand why their brilliant uniforms and manly ways are spurned for a couple of fatuous scribblers. Muriel Dixon, formerly prima donna of the Doily Car Company and now of the Metropolitan Opera Company, is our patient today. We are outside Castle Bunthorn. Young ladies dressed in aesthetic draperies are grouped about. The play, they play on lutes as they sing and all are in the last stage of despair. magic in this love of ours, rivals as we all are in the affections of our Reginald. The very hopelessness of our love is a bond that binds us to one another. Fools! I beg your pardon? Fools and blind. The man loves, wildly loves. But whom? None of us. No, none of us. His weird fancy has lighted for the nonce on patience, the village milkmaid. On patience? Oh, it cannot be. Bah! But yesterday, I caught him in her dairy, eating fresh butter with a tablespoon. Today, he is not well. But Patience boasts that she has never loved, that love is to her a sealed book. Oh, he cannot be serious. Tis but a passing fancy. Twill quickly wear away. For Reginald, if you but knew, 
What a wealth of gold and love is waiting for you, stored up in this rugged old bosom of mine. The milkmaid's triumph would be short indeed. <laughs> always seem to have so much on their minds. The truly happy never seem quite well. There is a transcendentality of delirium, which the earthly might easily mistake for indigestion, but it is not indigestion. It is aesthetic transfiguration. Enough of babble. Um, but stay, I have some news for you. The 35th Dragoon Guards have halted in the village and are even now on their way to this very spot. The 35th Dragoon Guards? They are fleshly men, full habit. We care nothing for Dragoon Guards. But bless me, you were all engaged to them a year ago. A year ago? My poor child, you don't understand these things. A year ago, they were very well in our eyes. But since then, our taste have been etherealized, our perceptions exhausted. Come, it is time to lift up our voices in morning carol to our Reginald. Let us to his door. When he lost his maiden's wings, Want a receipt for that popular mystery known to the world as a heavy dragoon? <laughs> Take all the remarkable people in history, rattle them off to a popular tune. <laughs> the pluck of 
Lord Nelson on board of the victory. Genius of Bismarck devising a plan. The humor of fielding which sounds contradictory. Coolness of Paget about to pan. The science of Julian, the eminent musico. Wit of Macaulay who wrote of Queen Anne. The pathos of Paddy as rendered by Boussico. Style of the bishop of soda and man. The dash of a Dorsey divested of quackery. Narrative powers of Dickens and Thackeray. Victor Emmanuel, peak hunting Peveril. Thomas Aquinas and Dr. Sacheverell. Tupper and Tennyson, Daniel Defoe. Anthony Trollope and Mr. Guizot. All that is usable, melt them all down in a pipkin or crucible, set them to simmer and take over the storm. And a heavy dragoon is the ready want a receipt for the soldier like Paragon, get at the wealth of the Tsar if you can, the family pride of a Spaniard from Aragon, force of Mephisto pronouncing a ban, the smack of Lord Waterford, reckless and rollicking, swagger of Roderick heading his clan, the keen penetration of Paddington Pollocky, grace of an odalisk on a divan, the genius strategic of Caesar or Hannibal, skill of Sir Garnet and thrashing a cannibal, flavor of Hamlet, the stranger, a touch of him, little of Manfred, but not very much of him, beetle of Burlington, Richardson, Shaw, Mr. Micawber and Madame Tussauds. Well, here we are once more on the scene of our former triumphs. But where's the Duke? Here I am. Come, come, cheer up. Don't give way. Oh, for that I'm as cheerful as a poor devil can be expected to be. Who has the misfortune to be a duke with a thousand a day? Hmm. Most men would envy you. Exactly. But I couldn't stand it any longer, so I joined this second-class cavalry regiment. In the army, thought I, I shall be occasionally snubbed, perhaps even bullied. Who knows? The thought was retro, and here I am. Yes. And here are the ladies. But who is the gentleman with the long hair? I don't know. He seems popular. Mm, he does seem popular. Young and wealthy, dark and fair, all of county family. And we die for love of thee, twenty lovesick maidens we. Though my book I seem to stand in a rustic aesthetic way, like a literary man who despises female play, I hear plainly all they say, twenty lovesick maidens say. He hears plainly all they say, twenty lovesick maidens say. Though so excellent and wise, and yet so mortal Leave us. Our minds are but ill-tuned to light love talk. <clears throat> but what in the world has come over you all? Banton, he has come over us. He has come among us, and he has idealized us. Uh, has he succeeded in idealizing you? He has. Good old Banton. My eyes are open. I droop. Despairingly, I am soulfully intense. I am limp, and I cling. This is all very well, 
But you seem to forget that you are engaged to us. It can never be. You are not Empyrean. You are not Delacruscan. You are not even early English. Oh, be early English, ere it is too late. Red and yellow, uh, primary colours. Oh, South Kensington. We didn't design our uniforms, but we don't see how they could be improved. No, you wouldn't. Still, there is a cobwebby grey velvet with a tender bloom, like cold gravy, which made Florentine 14th century, trimmed with Venetian leather and Spanish altar lace, and surmounted with something uh, Japanese, it matters not what, would at least be early English. Come, maiden. Gentlemen, this is an insult to the British uniform. A uniform that has been as successful in the courts of Venus as on the field of Mars. <laughs> I first put this uniform on, I said as I looked in the glass, it's one to a million that any civilian my figure and form will surpass. Gold lace has a charm for the fair, and I've plenty of that and do spare, while a lover's professions when uttered in Hessians are eloquent everywhere. A fact which I counted upon when I first put this uniform on. I did love with the different and I reckon upon the same thing I can be when I first put this uniform on. I said when I first put it on, it is plain to the various dots that every beauty will feel it her duty to yield to its glamour at once. They will see that I'm freely gold-laced in a uniform handsome and chaste, but the peripatetics of long-haired aesthetics are very much more to their taste, which I never counted upon when I first put this uniform on. I did love and I did not Goodbye, Mr. Bunthorne. We leave you in unenviable aesthetic solitude. Am I alone and unobserved? I am. Then let me confess, a languid love of lilies does not blight me. Lank limbs and haggard cheeks do not delight me. I do not care for dirty greens by any means. I do not long for all one sees that's Japanese. I am not fond of uttering platitudes in stained glass attitudes. In short, my medievalism's affectation, born of a morbid love of admiration. If you're anxious for to shine in the high aesthetic line as a man of culture rare, you must dig up all the germs of the transcendental terms and implant them everywhere. You must lie upon the daisies and discourse in upper places of your complicated state of mind. The meaning doesn't matter if it's only idle chatter of a transcendental kind. And everyone will say, as you walk your mystic way, if this young man expresses himself in terms too deep for me, why, what a very singularly deep young man this deep young man must be. Then the sentimental passion of a vegetable fashion must excite your language spleen. An attachment a la Plato for a bashful young potato or a not too French French bean. Though the Philistines may jostle, you will rank as an apostle in the high aesthetic band. If you walk a Piccadilly with a poppy or a lily in your medieval hand. And everyone will say, as you walk your flowery way, if he's content with the vegetable love, which would certainly not suit me, why, what a most particularly pure young man this pure young man must be. Ah, patience, come hither. I am pleased with thee. The bitter-hearted one who finds all else hollow is pleased with thee. Tell me, girl, do you ever yearn? I yearn my living. No, no. Do you know what it is to be heart-hungry? Do you know what it is to seek oceans and to find puddles? That's my case. Oh, I'm a cursed thing. Uh, don't go. If you please, I don't understand you. You frighten me. Don't be frightened. It's only poetry. Well, 
If that's poetry, I don't like poetry. Don't you? Can I trust her? Patience, you don't like poetry. Hush. Well, between you and me, I don't like poetry. Sir, I... Patience, I have long loved you. Let me tell you a secret. I'm not as bilious as I look. If you like, I will cut my hair. There is more innocent fun within me than a casual spectator would imagine. Sir, I will speak plainly. In the matter of love, I am untaught. I have never loved but my great aunt. But I am quite certain that under any circumstances, I couldn't possibly love you. Oh, you think not? I'm quite sure of it. Quite sure. Quite. Very good. Life is henceforth a blank. I don't care what becomes of me. I only ask that you will leave me and never renew the subject. Certainly. Broken-hearted and desolate, I go. Oh, to be wafted away from this black Alsaldama of sorrow, where the dust of an earthy today is the dust of a dusty tomorrow. It's a little thing of my own. I call it heart foam. Uh, I shall not publish it. Farewell, patient. Patient. Farewell. What on earth does it all mean? Why does he love me? Why does he expect me to love him? He's not a relation. It frightens me. <laughs> Why, patience, what is the matter? Lady Angela, tell me two things. Firstly, what on earth is this love that upsets everybody? And secondly, how is it to be distinguished from insanity? Why, love is the one unselfish emotion in this whirlpool of grasping greed. Oh, dear, oh. Why are you crying? <laughs> to think that I have lived all these years without having experienced this ennobling and unselfish passion. Why, what a wicked girl I must be. For it is unselfish, isn't it? Absolutely. Oh, try, try try to love. It really isn't difficult if you give your whole mind to it. I'll set about it at once. I won't go to bed until I'm head over the earth in love with somebody. Oh, noble girl. But is it possible that you have never loved anybody? Yes, one. Ah, who? My great aunt. Great aunts don't count. Then there's nobody. At least, no, nobody. Not since I was a baby. But that doesn't count, I suppose. I don't know. Tell me all about it. Long years ago, fourteen may be, when but a tiny baby of four, another baby played with me, my elder by a year or more. A little child of beauty there with mother's eyes and wonder. state I must be in. I had no idea that love was a duty. 
I don't think I'm respectable. I'd go at once and fall in love with a stranger. Pretty, pretty maiden, pretty, tell me true. Hey, but I'm no fool, willow, willow, whaley. Have you ever a lover a dangling after you? Hey, willow, whaley, oh. I would fain discover if you have a lover. Hey, willow, whaley, oh. Gentle, so my heart is frolicsome and free. Hey, but he's doleful, willow, willow, whaley. Can it be that you don't recognize me? Recognize you? No, indeed, I don't. Have 15 years so greatly changed me? 15 years? What do you mean? Have you forgotten the friend of your youth, your Archibald, your little playfellow? Archibald? Is it possible? Why, let me look. It is, it is, it must be. Oh, how happy I am. I thought we should never meet again. And how you've grown. Yes, Patience. I'm much taller than I was. And how you've improved. Yes, Patience. I am very beautiful. Ah, oh, me. But surely that doesn't make you unhappy. Yes, Patience. Oh, but why? My child love for you has never faded. Conceive then the horror of my situation when I tell you that it is my hideous destiny to be madly loved at first sight. By every woman I come across. But why do you make yourself so picturesque? Why not disguise yourself, disfigure yourself, anything to escape this persecution? No, no, Patience, that may not be. I am a trustee for beauty, and it is my duty to see that the conditions of my trust are faithfully discharged. And you, too, are a poet. Yes. I am the apostle of simplicity. I am called Archibald, the all right. For I am infallible. And is it possible that you condescend to love such a girl as I? Yes, Patience. Is it not strange? I have loved you with a Florentine 14th century frenzy for full 15 years. Oh, marvellous. I have hitherto been deaf to the voice of love. I seem now to know what love is. It has been revealed to me. It is Archibald Grosvenor. Yes, Patience. It is. We will never, never part. We will live and die together. I swear it. We both swear it. But, oh, horror. What's the matter? Why, you are perfection. A source of endless ecstasy to all who know you. I know I am. Well? Then, bless my heart, there can be nothing unselfish in loving you. Merciful powers. I never thought of that. Our duty is clear. We must part and forever. Oh, misery. And yet... I cannot question the propriety of your decision. Farewell, Patience. Farewell, Archibald. But stay. Yes, 
Patience? Although I may not love you, for you are perfection, there's nothing to prevent your loving me. Mm. I am plain, homely, unattractive. Why, that's true. The love of such a man as you, for such a girl as I, must be unselfish. Unselfishness itself. Though to marry you would very selfish be. Hey, but I'm doleful, willow, willow, whaley. You me all the same, continue loving me. Hey, willow, whaley, oh. All, all the, the world, world ignoring, ignoring, you'll go on adoring. Hey, willow, whaley, oh. Now, Bunthorn enters crowned with roses and hung about with garlands and looking very miserable indeed, followed by the maidens. They are dancing classically and playing on cymbals, double pipes, and other archaic instruments. Patience's barbarity by the advice of my solicitor in aid, in aid of a deserving charity I put myself up to be raffled for. Come, Lady Jane, I pray you draw the first. He loved me best. I want to know the worst. Hold! Say your hand! What means this interference? What this poker? I pray you make a clear. Many a week, she's loved me fondly and has feared to speak. But nature, for restraint to mighty power, has burst the bonds of us. And here we are. No, Mr. Bumpo, no, you're wrong again. Permit me, I'll endeavor to Shameless one, is there no chance for any of them? Ah! 
godlike grace proclaims he comes of noble race. And who is this whose manly face bears sorrow's interesting trace? I am a broken hearted troubadour whose mind's aesthetic and whose tastes are pure. He is aesthetic. Yes, yes. I am aesthetic and poetic. Let's be Closes the first act of Gilbert and Sullivan's comic aesthetic opera, Patience. The second act setting is a sylvan glade. Lady Jane d is discovered leaning on a double bass, upon which she presently accompanies herself. The fickle crew have deserted Reginald and sworn allegiance to his rival, and all forsooth, because he has glanced with passing favor on a puling milk. Fools! Of oh, that fancy he will soon weary, and then I, who alone am faithful to him, shall reap my reward. But do not dally too long, Reginald, for my charms are ripe, and already they are decayed. Better secure me, ere I have gone too far. <laughs> Is the river 
Here, Lady Jane leaves, and Grosvenor enters, followed by the maidens. The old, old tale. How rapturously these maidens love me, and how hopelessly. Oh, patience, patience, with the love of thee in my heart, what have I for these poor mad maidens but an unvalued pity? Oh, sir, you are indeed a true poet, for you touch our hearts, and they go out to you. Ladies, I am sorry to appear ungallant, but this is Saturday, and you have been following me about ever since Monday. I should like the usual half-holiday. I shall take it as a personal favor if you will kindly allow me to close early today. Oh, sir, do not send us from you. Oh, poor, poor girl. Ah, it is best to speak plainly. I know that I am loved by you, but I never can love you in return, for my heart is fixed elsewhere. Remember the fable of the magnet and the churn? But we don't know the fable of the magnet and the churn. Don't you? Then I will see it to you. A magnet hung in a hardware shop And all around was a loving crop Of scissors and needles, nails and knives Offering love for all their lives But for iron the magnet felt no whim Though he charmed iron, it charmed not him From needles and nails and knives he turned For he'd set his love on a silver churn A silver churn A silver churn His most aesthetic, very magnetic fancy took this turn If I can wheedle a knife or a needle, why not a silver churn? His most aesthetic, very magnetic fancy took this turn And iron and steel expressed surprise. The needles opened their well-drilled eyes. The pen knives felt shut up, no doubt. The scissors declared themselves cut out. The kettles they boiled with rage, tis said. While every nail went off its head And hither and thither began to roam Till a hammer came off And drove them home It drove them home It drove them home While this magnetic, peripatetic lover He lived to learn By no endeavor can magnet ever attract a silver churn While this magnetic, peripatetic lover He lived to learn Last they are gone. What is this mysterious fascination that I seem to exercise over all I come across? A curse on my fatal beauty, for I am sick of conquest. Archibald! Oh, patience. I had escaped with difficulty from my Reginald. I wanted to see you so much that I might ask you if you still love me as fondly as ever. Love you? If the devotion of a lifetime... Hold! Unhand me or I scream. If you are a gentleman, pray remember that I am another's. But you do love me, don't you? Madly, hopelessly, despairingly. That's right. I never can be yours, but that's right. And you love this bunthorn? With a heart whole ecstasy that withers and scorches and burns and stings. It is my duty. Admirable girl. Uh, but you're not happy with him. Happy? I am miserable beyond description. That's right. I never can be yours, but that's right. But go now. I see dear Reginald approaching. Dear Reginald. Farewell, dear Archibald. I cannot tell you how happy it has made me to know that you still love me. Ah, if I only dared... Sir, this language to one who is promised to another... Oh, Archibald, think of me sometimes, for my heart is breaking. He is so unkind to me. And you would be so loving. Loving. Advance one step, and as I'm a good and pure woman, I scream. Farewell, Archibald. Stop there. Think of me sometimes. Advance at your peril. Once more, adieu. Oh. Love is a plaintive song, sung by a suffering maid. Telling a tale of wrong, telling of hope betrayed, tune to each changing note. Sorry when he is sad, blind to his every mood. Merry when he is glad, merry when he is glad. 
Everything has gone wrong with me since that smug-faced idiot came here. Before that, I was admired. I might say loved. Too mild, Reginald. Adored. Uh, Jane, do let a poet soliloquize. The damosels used to follow me wherever I went. Now they all follow him. Not all. I am still faithful to yes, you. Yes, and a pretty damosel you are. No, not pretty. Massive. Cheer up. I will never leave you, I swear it. Oh, thank you. I know what it is. It's his confounded mildness. They find me too highly spiced, if you please. And no doubt I am highly spiced. Not for my taste. No, but I am for theirs. But I will show the world I can be as mild as he. If they want insipidity, they shall have it. I'll meet this fellow on his own ground and beat him on it. You shall, and I will help you. You will? Jane, there's a good deal of good in you after all. There, run along. Grosvenor approaches. I shall face him. Ah, Bunthorne. Ah, Grosvenor. I'm in no mood for trifling. What is amiss? Ever since you came here, you have entirely monopolized the attentions of the young ladies. I don't like it, sir. My dear sir, how can I help it? Sir, until you came here... I was adored. Exactly. Until I came here. That's my grievance. I cut everybody out. I assure you, if you could only suggest some means whereby, consistently with my duty to society, I could escape these inconvenient attentions, you would earn my everlasting gratitude. I will do so at once. However popular it may be with the world at large, your personal appearance is highly objectionable to me. It is. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. How can I express my gratitude? By making a complete change at once. Your conversation must henceforth be perfectly matter-of-fact. You must cut your hair. In appearance and costume, you must be absolutely commonplace. No. Pardon me. That's impossible. Take care. When I am thwarted, I am, I am very terrible. I can't help that. I am a man with a mission. And that mission must be fulfilled. I don't think you quite appreciate the consequences of thwarting me. I don't care what they are. Suppose, I won't go so far as to say that I will do it, but suppose for one moment I were to curse you. Oh, no. Ah, very well. Take care. But surely you would never do that. I don't know. It would be an extreme measure, no doubt. Still. But you would not do it. I'm sure you would not. Oh, reflect, reflect. You had a mother once. Never. Oh, then you had an aunt. Ah. ah, I see you had. By the memory of that aunt, I implore you to pause ere you resort to this last fearful expedient. Oh, Mr. Bunthorne, reflect, <laughs> reflect. I must not allow myself to be unmanned. It is useless. Consent at once. Or may your nephew's curse... Hold. Are you absolutely resolved? Absolutely. Will nothing shake you? Nothing. I am adamant. Very good. Then I yield. Ah, you swear it? I do, cheerfully. I have long wished for a reasonable pretext for such a change as you suggest. It has come at last. I do it on compulsion. Victory! I triumph. When I go out the door, a damsel to score, all sighing and burning and clicking and yearning will follow me as before. I shall with cultured taste, distinguished gems from paste, and high diddle diddle will sound as a niddle if I pronounce it chaste. A most intense young man, a soulful eyed young man, and not a poetical, super aesthetical, out of the way young man. Conceive me if you can, an everyday young man, a common face type with a stick and a pipe and a half red, black and tan, who thinks suburban hops, more fun than Monday pops, who's fond of his dinner and doesn't get thinner on bottled beer and chops. A commonplace young man, a matter of fact young man, a steady and solid and jolly back holiday every day young man. A Japanese young man, a blue and white young man, Francisco de Rimini, Mimini, Primini, Genesee Qua young man. A Chancery Lane young man, a Somerset House young man, a very delectable, highly respectable, thrifty bus young man. A pallid and thin young man, a haggard and lank young man, a greenery gallery grown in a gallery put in the grave young man. A Sewell and Cross young man, a Howell and James young man, a pushing and particle, what's the next article, Waterloo House young man. Conceive me if you can, a matter of fact young man, an alphabetical, arithmetical, an everyday young man and see me if you can a crotchety crack young man and not a poetical super aesthetical out of the way young man. man it's all right I have committed my last act of ill nature and henceforth I'm a changed character conceive me if you can Reginald a of fact young man dancing and, and what in the world is the matter with you patience I'm a changed man 
Hitherto I've been gloomy, moody, fitful, uncertain in temper, and selfish in disposition. You have indeed. Well, all that is changed. Observe how amiable I am. But, Reginald, how long will this last? Well, with occasional intervals for rest and refreshment, as long as I do. Oh, Reginald, I'm so happy. Oh, dear, dear, Reginald. I cannot express the joy I feel at this change. It will no longer be a duty to love you, but a pleasure, a rapture, an ecstasy. My darling. But, oh, horror. Well, what's the matter? Is it quite certain that you have absolutely reformed? That you are henceforth a perfect being, utterly free from defect of any kind? It's quite certain. I've sworn it. Then I never can be yours. Why not? Love to be pure must be absolutely unselfish. And there can be nothing unselfish in loving so perfect a being as you have now become. Uh, but stop a bit. I don't want no, to change. No. I'll relapse. I'll be as I was. Ah, interrupted. Angela, Ella... Sapper, why, what does this mean? It means that Archibald the All Right cannot be all wrong. And if the All Right chooses to discard aestheticism, it proves that aestheticism ought to be discarded. In fact, Archibald looks quite fetching in an ordinary business suit. Oh, Archibald. Archibald. I'm shocked, surprised, horrified. I can't help it. I'm not a free agent. I do it on compulsion. This is terrible. Go. I shall never set eyes on you again, but... Oh, George! Why, what's the matter? Is it quite, quite certain that you will always be a commonplace young man? Always, I've sworn it. Why, then, there's nothing to prevent my loving you with all the fervor at my command. Why, that's true. My Archibald. My Pyshen. Crushed again. Cheer up, I am still here. I have never left you, and I never will. Thank you, Jane. After all, there's no denying it. You're a fine figure of a woman. My Reginald. My Jane. Ladies, the Duke has at length determined to select a bride. Oh, yes, I have a great gift to bestow. Approach, such of yours are truly lovely. Yes, in personal appearance, you have all that is necessary to make a woman happy. But uh, in common fairness, I think I ought to choose the only one among you who has the misfortune to be distinctly plain. Jane. You crushed again. After much debate internal, I on Lady Jane decide. Sapphire now may take the Colonel and she be the major bride. In that case, unprecedented single, I must live and die. I shall have to be contented with the tulip all the life. She will have to be contented with the tulip all the life. Thus, Gilbert, with his knack for upside-down logic, settles the vexing problem of who is to be Bunson's bride, to the satisfaction of everyone concerned except possibly the aesthetic boy himself. Thank you for listening. You have been listening to Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera, Patience, featuring Muriel Dixon as Patience. Under the musical direction of Harold Sanford, this broadcast was produced by William S. Rainey. The commentator was Brooks Atkinson. This is the National Broadcasting Company, RCA Building, Radio City, New York.